Hi, this is Jen with Iowa Backyard Farmer. I thought I'd give you a little update, maybe a little background on our food forest. Um, you see us on a beautiful Friday morning, but it's cold. I'm wearing my jacket. Steven's wearing his jacket. Um, everything's in full bloom, but we've got a, a freeze warning. So every year about this time, this is seasonal for Iowa, it can freeze clear into May if it wants to, but my plum trees get fooled and my other things get fooled. And so we're pondering what to do. This weekend is a good weekend to remember that farming, gardening is not for the faint of heart. Everybody's like, oh, I'm gonna take up a nice peaceful hobby like gardening. Um, this time of year, it's a, little, it's a little exciting. We've got a freeze warning tonight, a freeze watch tomorrow. There's, what are we gonna do? These trees are a little bit big to, to cover. Um, we've tried that, we've tried covering them. We covered this one last year even with a heater. Um, it worked. We still didn't very much fruit. We got like one plum. The apples don't come out quite as early. If you look in on here, these buds are still really tight. They should be fine. They should be fine. Usually apples come out a lot later but my peach tree has committed itself to spring. And um, you can see it has a really simple bloom. It's totally exposed. We've tried different things to try and keep them from freezing. You could run a sprinkler on this. The trick with adding water when it's freezing is that you can't stop until the weather is above freezing again. Otherwise your ice will freeze and you'll cause more damage than you were gonna have before. So at this time, I'm, I'm praying that it stays windy because wind would also help. Some big orchards will run great big wind fans, try and keep the frost from settling. Um, that's expensive too. But if we get a nice cold, clear night and the, the winds drop, then, then we'll freeze, we'll freeze. So question on food forests, you may look at this and say, well, this isn't exactly what a food forest looks like and what are pine trees doing in it? And uh, the answer is, that's not what we started out to do. When we first moved in here, we thought, well, we face these ugly power lines and roads, so we're gonna build a screen. And, and we planted the trees and it wasn't until a few years later that we decided that we were gonna grow as much food as we can. We kind of took this as a, personal challenge. Stephen grew up on a farm and I grew up with a, a nice garden and, and canning and so we always knew we wanted to grow something. But it wasn't until, I don't know, was it six or seven years ago that we decided, okay, Stephen, you've got a master's in agronomy, certified crop specialist. I've got a degree in horticulture. What could we do if we really tried to grow our own food? And we did several different methods. Our first Thing was to just grow a regular garden and we're gonna add some fruit trees and, and things and then we found some permaculture principles and we're like well we could do that too so you'll see around a lot of these trees you've got rhubarb it's a great nutrient accumulator it has really deep roots it doesn't mind the cold we it'll reach down deep under the soil and, and drag up some of those nutrients comfrey that's right next to it is gonna do the same thing the daffodils are planted around the fruit trees sort of as protection. We lost probably 11 or 12 trees to voles right after we planted them because they would come and eat the roots. It turns out they really, really like the bark on apple trees and the roots. And, and so you'll see around here that they're trying to get the different layers like you'd have in, in permaculture. We're trying to solve problems by doing things more than one way. This area, Stephen, I think told you last week, it tended to be really wet because we get so much downspout and there's a lot of clay here and it didn't drain really well. But these these crops around the, the bottom, even the ones we can't eat, are gonna help uh, break up the clay and, and help it to drain better. Um, variety is important. So it wasn't very long into gardening that we realized that you could lose a whole crop. So if we come over here, you can see that we've got a lot of things in, in a, one place. This is a, a black currant bush. And you can see it's getting ready to bloom. And over here, the blueberries, and they are, if you get up really close, you can see.
see that they're just leafing out and and they're gonna bloom and we've got 10 or so varieties of blueberries this is a really tall high bush one this is a, a really short one and you're kind of just trying to increase your odds of success right one year something might work one year another year something might work and, uh, and so we just try different things a good example of what am I gonna do with it so this is a, a gummy berry it's related to I think autumn olives and and they're beautiful they are thorny um, but they set fruit all these little blossoms are gonna become a nice red fruit and it tastes kind of like a cherry when it's fresh off the bush let's go around front to the honey berries got a praying mantis case here. We get a bunch of these. They love these lilac bushes. We planted these just because they're pretty. The wind whips around and the, when it's blooming and it smells fantastic. And the boysenberries. This is another, we're always trying to stretch. This is a zone six plant and you can see that it is, we'll see how it does this weekend, but it is just about ready to bloom. And every year we've gotten just a few off of it. And I think because we get a late frost and it knocks back my, my blooms, but we'll see if we're gonna cover that one or not. Okay, so these are the honeyberries. And you can see that this one, they're all different varieties. And this one's in full bloom. And the bumblebees love this. This is an early source of food for them. It's one of the first things that comes out. And I said, there's different varieties. And so they don't all fruit at the same time. And they're they're very hardy. They're very hardy. I don't worry about them in a in a frost at all. They're from a northern, more northern place than we are. And um, they have a good berry. Some people describe it like a blueberry. It's a little tangier. It's got a little thicker skin. So when I'm working with it, like the kids want to make freezer jam and stuff and it, and it works really well for that. Usually I'm going to blend it with a different fruit, but I'm going to puree this one because the skin's a little thicker and I didn't want big thick chunks in there, but the flavor is pretty good. The flavor is really good. And our raspberries are coming. They're, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. I'm not worried about them. And Mama, our cat, she's an integral part of this. We're not allowed to have chickens. We're not allowed to have all sorts of things. But last year, this cat, feral cat, adopted us and had two sets of kittens in our backyard. So we took her in for to the TNR, and and um, she's now now tagged and, and ready to go. But she keeps all the buddies and bulls away. And I'm I'm really proud of her. She's a mighty hunter in our backyard. Here's an example of unintended consequences. So let's look at this mess right here. So part of permaculture principles is that you're going to observe what's going on and then sort of build around that, right? And so we have this great big house in the middle of our lot and it, and it blocks the sunlight, but it doesn't block all the sunlight. And so this spot right here is really sunny around the corner for part of the day and then under the deck gets practically no sunshine all day. And you can see the downspout that comes down here. This tends to be a wetter spot and, and we have struggled to figure out what to grow here. So Stephen's planted an apple tree in between the daylilies and, and other things that we have here and we'll see, see how that works. Um, this great plant that you can see here, this is a tarragon, and this is what I thought was gonna be a, a happy little herb. Turns out to be like a four and a half foot tall herb, and we don't eat that much tarragon. It makes a really great green goddess dressing and you know some other little things, put it in your eggs, but um, it's taking over, and so we need to figure out what to do with it. 
Um, here's another problem that you might have seen. People are always like, well, we're gonna plant it and it's gonna go wild. We had strawberries in this bed that you now see onions in a few years ago. And the strawberries have runners and they came through the fence and they planted this area. And I thought, well, that's great. They're naturalizing, they're gonna, they're gonna do great. But one thing strawberries are not good at is controlling grass. And grass has come back into this, this area. And so we're gonna need to either move the strawberries or pull out all the grass. And um, we haven't figured out what to do with it. It is not as productive. So, you know, I know that there are lots of ways that you could put like everybody's like, well, it's gonna look all natural. It's gonna look like a forest, but it turns out that annual plants and perennial plants have really different needs. And so we've kept our, our annual plants in garden boxes and you'll see a lot of perennials out in the landscape. Hi, right. and there, here's for your native and non-native. This is a quince and it's in full bloom. It smells fantastic. It puts on a, a lovely fruit, but you can see it's committed to full bloom and we may lose all the fruit this year in, in a freeze. We'll see how cold it gets. And then right next to it, this is a aronia berry and we've got a whole bunch of these and you can see this is an Iowa native and uh, it's gonna be just fine in a freeze. It's not bloomed out yet. I'm going to worry about it anyway, because that's what we do. But we've got a bunch of those all down here. And then <laughs> I'll show you. They're kind of sad. It's kind of sad. But you can see this is a, a service berry. Again, it's going to be just fine. But you can see that it, it looks kind of beat up. And why is it beat up? Because it doesn't have a cage around it. Look, the erronea berries. We had rabbits. And rabbits absolutely demolish things in my early spring. And they've cut down the service berry so many times that it thinks it's thinks it's a shrub. I mean, you've got all these these little things. We're hoping that with a cat on board, maybe maybe we won't lose quite so much of my service berry every year because the rabbits like that one. I'm trying to remember what we didn't show you last time. provides us with a lot of fruit every year too and um, it's right under a birch tree so speaking of zones this the current bushes will take a little bit of shade and um, this birch tree is just about the right kind of shade it's not real thick shade but we've got a lot of current bushes under trees and the rhubarb here is going to be fine in the cold it's going to take over if they're in little boxes and then here's an example again of things that are getting away from you. This is a lemon balm and it's it's wonderful, it's tasty. I come out and I eat a leaf here and there, but it's also, if you turn around, it's also escaped into this, this other area. So we've got a lot of perennial kind of wildflowers in here and a lot of lemon balm. So you can't just set it up and think it's gonna stay. This is a, a cup plant. This is a native Iowa thing, and, and it looks really cute now, but it'll grow about that tall and have sunflowers type flowers on it. And uh, you can see the stem is square, and it's even after all winter, it's really, it's pretty structurally strong. And um, it also is very happy and wants to spread. The cool thing about this one is that the cups come out right around the stem and it'll hold water for your pollinators. And right next to it is a weed. And this is a, this is a, oh, it's a honeysuckle bush of some sort. And the birds really like this, but it's not native and it's invasive. So we're gonna have to pull stuff like this out. And that's 
probably the biggest problem we've had in Iowa. We grew up in the West where I felt like we had to talk everything into living. It was dry. Um, things just didn't spontaneously erupt. And here where we've got a pretty good situation for things to grow, we get a lot of elm trees and honeysuckle and poison ivy and, and things that are just gonna spontaneously show up. The birds bring in the seeds and we spend a lot more time in the spring editing and trying to pull things out than we do trying to plant things because it, it really, it's really good dirt. <laughs> it's really good dirt. This is another black currant bush. This is a different one. You can see this one's going to have yellow blooms on it, and it, they're great big. My black currants have tended to do better here than my red currants. I'll show you an example. They keep dying back. Um, this is a red lake, or was a red lake currant, and um, it's not doing anything this year. You can see maybe one one little branch back there that's decided to grow. Um, it's just it's just died back um, and right next to it this one's just a, a year or two newer this is also the red current but it's it's blooming out just fine so we might see what we can see what we can do with that and it's always a process of of changing it everybody's like well I'm gonna do it once it's gonna be set it's gonna be perfect and that has not been our experience at any of this, we're like, we're gonna try this. And that worked, or didn't work, and we'll try again. Or it worked too well, and we're gonna try again. We, we have done that one too. Um, an example of that is in this back corner. So, we've done lots of things on this slope. Originally, we, we just wanted flowers on the slope because it kind of, was steep to mow and we're like well it'd be better than grass to have flowers and, and and it really was and then we decided well food would be even better than flowers and so we planted things like this high bush cranberry and it's it's more of a native ish type thing and it's it's really happy but it wasn't the first thing we planted the first thing we planted was these these cornelian cherries you can see we're finally getting one, but we've had to replace all of them. This is a cornelian cherry and it'll bloom and it has a really pretty fruit on it. Makes good jam and other things. But I think it's try number six on this one. It's It's been a while. It's been a while. So you keep keep modifying, keep, keep changing. We've added, you know, the daylilies here where used to be the only thing. And then we added irises because we had some irises and then Stephen thought, well, we could have some spring color and we added some bulbs. And it has evolved over time as the trees have gotten bigger. We've had to pull out more day lilies and we'll get more shade in different areas. And it's kind of this always evolving project, but it's really fun. And um, I think that's it for today. So have a good one and we'll talk to you later. Bye.